Hey, you. Oh. Spinner. Oh, thank goodness. Hi, I'm Dory. I'm Name's Hank. How sick are you? Sick? I'm sick? Why else would you be in quarantine? Oh, no. How long do I have? I have to find All my family. All right, now don't get hysteric. Uh-oh. Not good. What? What is it? What happened? Oh, what's that? That there is bad news. It's a transport tag for fish who can't cut it inside the Institute. They get transferred to permanent digs, an aquarium. Hi folks, I'm Ignacy Vishnevetsky. And I'm Alex Dabb. We're here this week again at Farmhouse Tavern, just around the corner from the AV Club office. Welcome to Film Club. So, Finding Dory is sort of the Jaws 3 of Pixar sequels. The film is set almost entirely at this big California marina park. Now, the original film, Andrew Stanton's 2003 original, was set primarily in large expanses of the Pacific Ocean. The movie kind of inverts the original in that, you know, in the first film, it's Albert Brooks's character, Marlon, who's chasing his son across the ocean. Basically. Right, and Dory, who's voiced by Ellen DeGeneres, tags along and here's his sidekick, yeah, essentially, yeah. yeah. The sequel, sort of switching things up, moves it to this marina park where the characters are sort of separated in different pools and different tanks. And this film not only shifts focus to Dory, it basically has her looking for the parents that she mm -hmm. sort of all, all these years later forgot that she had. It's very cleverly sort of reworking the exact same premise as the original and just relocating it to this much more in contained environment. I, I find this, especially with some of the more recent Pixar films, where I'm starting to see the strings a little bit more. You've become, you could say, acclimated to the formula. Yeah. You know what it's like, you know how, what they're going to do. You've got the, the character who is this kind of misanthropic, well, you wouldn't call it misanthropic, right? Because he is not, he's not it's not people that he relates right. to. But this, this prickly octopus yeah. character, who will, of course, become softened over yeah. time. Although I think that, that it's funny because that character clearly serves a narrative function, mm -hmm. but I also think he serves a logistic function because so much of the movie is getting characters who can only swim yeah, from one you need to part get of them this. From the water. So he's got legs, yeah. you know, he's, well, got, he's got tendrils, so he can well, he can swoop them around. And, and the movie kind of cheats that a little bit where like, I, I, I think a, a slightly smarter Pixar film would think of really inventive ways to get them from point A to point B. This mm -hmm. film's just like, ah, bird grabs them and flies them over yeah, there. Bird grabs them or they get tossed. They get tossed out of so many a lot of containers, <laughs> containers of water into other containers of water. But it, it's not that visually compelling. And there's so much that could be done with that environment and so much that right. Pixar has done in the past with very small environments. You know, you think of something like, well, even something like Pizza Planet mm -hmm. from, from sure. the first Toy Story. Well, they, and Stanton has, mm -hmm. I mean, Wally has that. The second half of the film is set aboard that ship, and we're yeah. basically in this giant sort of rotating mall. And that's the kind of environment that I feel like this maybe could have been transformed into, where you have yeah, because this sort you're of right because because the, the, here yeah. the environment actually gets bigger in the last in the last part of the film, right. and that's where it's sort of lost me because I feel like the premise, right? You've got this little fish that can't remember anything. She just remembered that she has to find her parents. So there's a moment in, in Finding Nemo, in the original, where Dory is lost and she doesn't know, she doesn't know, she doesn't remember anything. And she's asking various fish, you know, who is she, where, where is she, where are her friends? That's sort of an underrated moment in the pantheon of, of like sort of Pixar heartbreaking scenes. Mm -hmm. And this movie seems to build all, all of its emotional material off of that same idea. Yeah. So we're just seeing sort of an echo of, the most sort of powerful moment in the first film. If I had to pinpoint a problem with this film, I think it's a problem of scale. If you look at the last few Pixar films, the, the more ambitious ones have gotten more and more interiorized mm -hmm. and uh, they've sort of, they've constrained the action more and mm -hmm. more. And uh, I mean, that's, that's true of something like Toy Story 3, I think, sure. but it's, uh, the perfect example is really inside out. And here, kind of the main driver of the plot is a character's memories, right? Dory has very poor memory, very poor short-term memory. Mm -hmm. We're constantly getting these flashbacks and that's what advances the plot. But then at the same time here, there's kind of a disconnect because there's still all of this kind of exterior action. There's a big action finale mm -hmm. where basically half the characters are out of the water. You've mm -hmm. got an octopus driving a truck, you know, with a fish reading directions. I think that most of Finding Dory isn't nearly madcap enough in a lot yeah. of respects. And then I feel like the ending overcorrects big time. Even by cartoon logic, a lot of what happens in the, the final stretch of this film is 
pretty ridiculous. I think the problem is that it could actually get more madcap. Having an octopus character mm -hmm. gives them this rare chance to really do very cartoony things with the way a character moves that they don't take quite enough advantage of. They have some you fun with it. Yeah. And, and also with the octopus's ability to camouflage. Mm -hmm. You know, Pixar's animation style, it's not gonna have somebody oh, right. drawing a tunnel on right. a wall and somebody tries to run into it. It's not gonna have people accidentally walking off a cliff. It's right. not a Looney Tunes animation style. It's very much grounded in keeping the, basically the bodies of these characters fairly consistent and keeping the physics mm -hmm. relatively consistent from scene to scene. And something like I almost think like the later Madagascar movies mm -hmm. is better suited to this kind of madcap uh, animation because it's not, or this kind of madcap action because it's not as grounded in realism. Sure. So I feel like formally that Pixar house style almost constrains the, mm -hmm. the later part of this movie. But at the yeah. same time, I feel like that's part of what makes it poignant is that these characters do stay a little bit more consistent, a little bit more like human characters. What to you is the, is the kind of the high point for? For Pixar. For Pixar as a studio? Yeah. Wally. -E. Also directed by Andrew Stanton. I remember first seeing Wally -E in theaters and thinking this company had moved from making family entertainments to just making entertainments. It had moved, like, that's, I think that's a science fiction film. You know, mm -hmm. and I don't think it requires any caveats. It requires any 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 framework, um, any all ages framework. It's sort of their most adventurous work. I think it's one of their most visually compelling. You have this long opening stretch that's just practically about a half an hour of wordless action. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just showed that you have Pixar has these sort of unlimited resources all coming from Disney, and that's the type of thing I'd love to see them expend them them on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think Ratatouille is is one of their more exceptional ones, and that's one that I think sort of breaks with formula a little bit because Brad Bird, uh, the director, the writer director, doesn't operate quite like his peers at the company, mm -hmm. and that's a film that feels entirely. I think that has its own identity and its mm -hmm. own distinctive voice in a way that some of I don't want to accuse Pixar of being an assembly line, but in a way that some of these uh, slightly more rigidly structured films do not. I think overall as a movie, yeah, I'll go with Wally -E there. But there are moments that I find a lot more moving. Um, the, the, these kind of these miniatures that to me are really what Pixar excels at. Mm -hmm. um, are you thinking of the, the opening? I think everybody thinks of the opening of Up, yeah. which is another film that is, I mean, to me, a much better film than Finding Dory, mm -hmm. but is an example of a film that has this really strong emotional mm -hmm. backing to it and then turns into this action That's narrative. my problem with Up. I mean, I've always, I mean, Up, Up is a very, very good film, and you're right that it does have this really strong emotional backbone that sort yeah. of carries it through. But there is a little bit of that. I think that was maybe one of the first times in a Pixar film when you noticed, oh, the endings of these movies are all kind of the same. Yeah. You know, they all shift to that. And Up feels especially indebted to the, the end of Monsters, Inc., mm -hmm. which has a very similar, we're sort of, dragging these characters through these, <laughs> these elaborate environments. I think there, there are these really just great chunks in these films, and that's what I tend to think back to mm -hmm. the most. But the question is, uh, you know, obviously in Toy Story 3, it depends, a lot of it depends on the buildup of the film, which I'm not as crazy about as I I'm am. I'm not as crazy about it either. Thank a lot, you. A lot of, because a lot I think of a lot of people sort of give that one a little bit of a free pass. Um, I mean, you're right that it has, it has wonderful moments. And it has, I mean, the incinerator scene is an amazing cathartic, like, especially to see at the end of this family franchise. There's something about that that feels like they're identifying certain buttons that they know that they can push, and they're pushing them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that, in, in that environment in Toy Story 3 ever really pays off in the way that it could as a central environment and as this sort of madcap backdrop. The movie sort of, for, for a bit, flirts with becoming a prison break film, but it never really totally... It never, you're, you're right, when, it, when they do give themselves constraints, and I think one reason that both you and I really like Wally -E is because it gives itself a constraint and it sticks to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not gonna have this robot talk nope. for a long portion of the film, and then it's all gonna be stuck in one environment for the last yep. portion of the film. It gives itself these two constraints and it's just going to stick to them. Yep. And I feel like a lot of Pixar films pass a certain point, they build this constraint, but then they eventually break it. And sometimes the way they break out of it is the best part of the film. Sure. They're breaking into a better film. Sure. But sometimes you wish that they had stuck with, like, I, I will watch a toy prison break. No. <laughs> right, right. Not that I would <laughs> rather, maybe, well, I'm not sure whether I'd rather have that than Toy Story 3. But. I would. <laughs> I would. Give me that. <laughs>